Amen. Kind of new to the uh, microphone situation here, so bear with me a second here. Okay, there we're green again. All right, can't stop me now. Amen. Uh, tonight, uh, well, I just want to say thanks for being part of the Bible study team with Pastor Lee and all those who participate. It's been a blessing. Um, they actually look into the study of the word and uh, be able to uh, put studies together. And uh, very thankful for that opportunity. Um, as we learn and grow together, God's got some victories for us, and so I appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to start with prayer. Lord, thank for these moments together, God, that we can come together and look at your word, Lord, and just uh, look at what you'd have us to hear, Lord. Look at you, what you'd have us to see, Lord, God. I pray that you get me out of the way with my opinions and my, uh, my looks, Lord, but just be able to look at your word to have a final destination for us in this life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My study tonight, uh, the uh, title would be The Victory, and I'm going to be using uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, and then later on we're going to move into uh, uh, chapter 15. And just if you're not familiar with Corinth, uh, the Corinthians letter from Paul, it was a, a letter that was a message. Um, I've got it as the seventh book of the New Testament, the 46th book of the Bible, and you're looking at around uh, 55 A.D. with the writings. And what was happening is Paul had established the church in Corinth, and he was there for, a, some say, 18 months to a two-year period, and then he moved on to Euphrates, and what's happening is he's writing letters back to the church, right, in the church of Corinth. Um, also, you'll see that information, that, or the establishment of that church in Acts chapter 18. Uh, the author, of course, is Paul, uh, once again with uh, Synophis, who is uh, the writer for, or the secretary for Paul's writings. Um, that Paul considered him a brother with the will of God, and of course he was a ruler of the synagogue of, in Corinth, um, and he's the same person that's mentioned in the uh, 18 Acts. So we'll start with the first scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints. So Paul is saying, well, you know, the brothers are going to the, the courts, the secular government, right, and not bringing matters before the saints. So Paul is kind of, I don't want to say miffed, but uh, kind of angered by that because in verse 2 he'll say, don't you know that the saints shall judge the world? Don't you know that? Right? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? So, you know, here he is telling the saints that they're going to be able to judge the world, but yet you're going not to be able to judge a small matter with your brethren. And there is no real deeper relation or deeper explanation of how to be judged by the world. And I do have a scripture in Revelations where Jesus talks about you'll be judged for, in, for the nations. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry about that. Is everybody okay then? Yeah. Okay. Verse 3, know ye not that you should judge angels? So he's saying to them that you're going to be judging angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? So if you're able to do all that, right, what he's telling them, how come you can't judge a small thing? And, he, and this is the concern at the time, too. When, when you took someone to court in that time frame, it was like an open, open air court out in the middle of the square or the, 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 the area where they had the court. And so you could be a passive buyer and you could hear people's court business going on because it was all public, you know. So he looks at that as, a, as something that's a negative because... Here you are, brothers of the Christian faith, in the church, in the small matters, and you can't bring yourself to a conclusion. 
So that's why he says in verse 5, I speak to your shame. It is so that it's not a wise man among you. So there's no wise men among you that to settle this. But no, not one that shall be able to be judged between his brethren. But the brother goes to the law with brother, and that, be, and that before the unbeliever. See, you know, we as believers or them as believers, you know, you should be knowing how to settle your differences with your brother without going to outside courts. Now, he's not saying, you know, for heinous crimes, you're going to be able to solve something. Of course, we need a government to take care of all that. But for small matters, it should be able to be settled from brother to brother in a private setting. So verse 7, he says, Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to the law one with another. And this is interesting, because he says, Why do you not rather take wrong? Right? Why not be wrong about it and just live with it? And then why do you not just suffer yourselves to be defrauded? You know, allow yourself to be defrauded and live with it. But yea, you know, do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. So here you are defrauding your brethren. You know, as a Christian, you shouldn't be defrauding your brother. You shouldn't be defrauding people at the lost world. So he's kind of the, the specific task of, hey, this is how things should be handled in the church, right? So verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? So now he's saying they're unrighteous, and he's going to give labels to the unrighteous, what the unrighteous do. And be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. So, you know, sex without the marriage, fornication, adultery, you have adultery in your life, something that stands before God. And uh, of course, adulterer, you're step, stepping out in your marriage. So, not, nor effeminate acting a woman, a, a man acting as a likeness of a woman, nor abusers of themselves and mankind. He's referring to homosexuality. He's talking nor thieves, right? Thievery. Nor covetous. You're coveting your brother's goods. Nor drunkards, right? We know what that. Revelers be angry, angsome people who are angry, speaking out in anger about things. Nor extortioners. You're not extorting. You're not stealing. Shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so these specific sins, these the, these people, he's giving specific labels, and these people are the sins. And then verse 11, and this is important because, and some such were some of you, but ye are washed. So he's saying these were some of you in that church in Corinth, but ye are washed and ye are sanctified. So sanctified is what we're all about this month, right? The sanctification. We're separating ourselves from the things of the world. But even in that church in Corinth in A.D. 55, sins of the culture of that time were leeching into the church, and Paul was taking care of it by speaking the things that become sound doctrine. But he says in verse 12, oh, sorry, i got to complete verse 11. But such some of you, you're washed and you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very important, justified. That's how we're sanctified, we're justified by the Spirit of God. In verse 12, he says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. So, all things are lawful for me, but I'm not brought unto any power of them, of any. So, you know, it's like the power of, you know, it's lawful for you to drink, right? But you're not brought unto the power of that. You won't allow yourself to be brought under the power. You know, he's referring to their sexual Im immaturity in their lives there because, you know, at that time in their society, you could have, you know, the Greek and the, and the Roman, they had temples where you give idols, you know, sacrifice to idols, and you had prostitutes that worked in the temples. So he's referring to that because verse thir 13, he says, beats for the belly and belly for the meats. So that's a phrase that they actually used, you know, like the phrases we used, if, if it feels good, do it, right? <clears throat> the other phrase that we would use, like, oh, if you're not hurting anybody, go ahead and do it, right? So belly for the meats and meats for the belly. So it's almost a justification. If I feel, if, sorry, this is, sorry. If I feel that it's the right thing to do, I'll do it, right? But 
that's not necessarily helpful to you as a Christian, right? That's not helpful. You know, just because you feel it's something to do doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be helpful for you in the long run. But later on he says, but God shall destroy both it and them. So they're going to destroy all the works and all the body, but the body is not for fornication. So he's referring back to the sexual fornication, not for the body. But, you know, in this instance, you know, the body's not for smoking. The body's not for vaping. You know, the body's not for taking drugs, right? But the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And I think that's one thing sometimes we forget, that the Lord dwells within us, right? And that we are the temple, the Holy Ghost. For in verse 14, the God has raised up the Lord will also raise up us by his own power. So that's the day of the resurrection for the saved, right? Verse 15, know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? So we as a body are members of Christ? Then he says, then shall I take the members of Christ and make them a members of harlots, right? God forbid that you're going to attach yourself to a harlot. And Paul saying what, you know, like you should know, right? Know not that you're joined to a harlot as one body, right? So if you're joined to a harlot as one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So if you're attached yourself, you become one flesh. And he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So free fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So this is very... Not news to them, but he's reassuring them that these things cannot be done. These things cannot be so for you to be called a Christian, for you to live a Christian life. Verse 19, he says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Like, are you surprised by that? that the Holy Ghost lives within you? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So, you know, God's given us the spirit, God's given us our body, and we are not our own. We are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in the body and in your spirit, which are God's. So these are God's. We are God's people, you know. And then, you know, you're, you're saying to yourself, hey, Jim, okay, man, that's, that's a lot of info there. That's a lot of do's and don'ts. Bees and not be. But where's the victory? Well, that's a good question, and I'm going to answer that. So if we're going to look at victory, right? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. We'll start out. So where's the, and then this is when I was reading this whole letter. It's like, where's the victory in all this? In Corinth, you know, there, there's a church established Paul established it. He saw things happening. He saw people getting saved. He saw, but then the cultures, people reverting back to the cultures that where they were involved in, you know. So he's trying to separate them back out, right? So admonishing them or telling them to do good works. But he says, where's the victory in the letter of the Corinthians? I'm going to look at 15. And where's the victory in our own lives? See, and this is the other thing I thought about too. You know, sometimes we're so focused but do we focus on our, res on our resurrection? We're going to be resurrected in a new body, in the new spirit. We're going to be resurrected. But you have to not live a corrupted life. You have to be living a life of Christianity, of caring, of loving one another, of putting down those things that are sin. Once you acknowledge sin in your life, you have to ask for God's mercy. Verse 50, and now, that I, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So that's what I was saying earlier. Corruption is not going to inherit. Behold, I will show you a mystery, and we shall not all sleep, but we will be changed. And this is of key importance because he says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the dead shall be raised incorruptible. 
So the raising of our bodies, the resurrection of our own selves, we will be raised incorruptible. For this corruption must put on incorruption, this body, right? And this mortal, this is us, mortal, must put on immortality, the ability to live forever, eternal life. So I just want to define like in 54. So when this corruption, right, when the Bible speaks of corruption, it's our human nature. The physical body is being prone to sin and decay. Shall put on incorruption. And I define incorruption as the state of being free from decay or corruption, often associated with eternal life. So immortality, that's one thing I see sometimes, I mean personally, I'll just put it on myself, I don't realize if I can make it to the end and be resurrected, I'll be immortal. There'll be a body for me, a spirit that I'll live forever. So in verse 55, he says that, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is thy victory? So where is the sting of death? Well, if you're raised in incorruption, you have no sting to death. And, God, and Paul is using the Hosea's words to taunt death, saying, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh death, where is thy sting? But if I go back to verse 54, and I want to finish, and this mortality shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So that's where the victory is at, folks. The sting of death is removed from your life. And the sting of death is sin, and the sing, strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God that we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there, therefore, my brother, be steadfast. So the letters to the church telling about the victory, the, the steadfastness, the resurrection and new eternal life, but the words to us living here right now, what is he saying? Therefore, my brother, be steadfast unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord, we'll just put it down Wednesday night service, Sunday, reaching people lost, sharing his gospel, going to the see the visitors, seeing the sick, visitations, the work of the Lord. Be steadfast in the work of the Lord, abounding in the work, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. And that he wants to put on there because it's not in vain, it's because Satan would have you weary in well-doing, right? He's going to wear you down. He's going to emotionally bring you anxiety, depression, you know, loss of life, loss of job, loss of things in this world. But, hey, there's still victory for you. There is victory in Jesus. And sometimes when it's hard to comprehend that Christ returns, both the dead in Christ and those who live will be transformed into an instant and a new glorified heavenly body death will be swallowed up in victory never to hurt anyone again and so you know at our bible studies we kind of go through things that were you know points you have to hit right but i want to hit these points tonight because the relevancy of this first corinthians 6 those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? It says it. You can go on YouTube, and you can go down that list, and you can see people doing all that, you know, to their own detrimentals, to their own sacrifice of their own life. So he's cutting it to the right there. Do these things. You shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You can identify what's right and wrong. When you were lost, you know, Right and wrong was whatever you felt like, right? You could do whatever. Your conscience would say, oh, yeah, you're doing all right, you know? You just satisfy your own conscience. But the right and wrong is because of what God has spelled out for us. So uh, Corinthians was sacked. The adherence to the theme of this month, well, the Corinthians are sanctified by Jesus Christ, just as we are today. Just as we are today. It's written in his word. The connection. For you, can you see yourself in the scripture? Can you see yourself redeemed from the world of being lost? You see yourself redeemed to the day of judgment? And what authority do we do this in? Well, 
It's easy enough. We can do all things through Christ Jesus, right? All power is given unto him and in heaven and in earth. And that's our focus because he's redeemed us from this life. The background, of course, being 55 AD where Paul established the church and the members there were taken back into the culture that they had been brought out of. Why do you think it's exciting and encouraged to know what Paul is referring to? Because I'm encouraged by the sanctification we even call out today, by the victory we call out today. We're encouraged by that. God has given us so much to be thankful for. So relational for us is the relation of the church to the letters. For our knowledge, you know, God has given us his word. The letters to the church, hey, think about it. It's nothing new under the sun, right? It's still there, you know. Bazillion years later, we're still going to be striving. We're still going to be striving for Christ. So the sanctification is bringing us out. And I'm thankful for that opportunity to, to know, you know, as Paul established the problem and he directly gave them the answer. Directly gave them the answer. The victory is in Christ Jesus. The resurrection is your, your ticket to heaven, right, basically. And it's a funny thing, because then you got people, oh, there is no resurrection. They were referring to that in Corinthians, too. There is no resurrection. Well, our faith is not, if our faith, there was no resurrection, then there's no reason to have faith, you know? So the faith is in the resurrection. So I just wanted to share those scriptures with you tonight. Um, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to look at his word and be able to say that, you know, God is good to us. Amen.